a quick introduction of the event tonight. I'm Eliza Cava, the Director of Conservation at Audubon Naturalist Society, and I'm so thrilled to have our wonderful moderator and panelists here tonight to join us for this month's Conservation Cafe. It's a critically important topic as well as you all know by joining us, and it's one that they speak with deep expertise and professional experience in the field and also personal experience. And I think you'll hear them um, uh, speak from these really rich bases of expertise um, throughout the evening. With just a little bit about the Conservation Cafe series, it began in January of 2017. And um, we, from the beginning, actually, I think our second talk was an, had an emphasis on environmental justice. It's a theme we've pursued uh, over the years repeatedly. And we have pivoted quickly to go online. And by going online, we've really broadened our audience and we've been so excited to do so. Sometimes we even have cats who never come to Wood and Nature Sanctuary at ANS's headquarters. Uh, so it's, it's really a joy to be able to share these important discussions with you all in this way. Um, your fee that you paid for tonight's um, event and for our other conservation cafes goes to support the conservation program at Audubon Naturalist Society and allows us to pay honoraria for our speakers. Um, for which we believe is very important um, in all of our instructional work and in this series in particular. Uh, Audubon Naturalist Society, for those who don't know us, is the oldest independent conservation organization in the DC area. We, ha we are not affiliated with National Audubon, except by way of sort of history and culture, but we're not a chapter, we're independent. And we have a conservation arm of which I'm the director, which we do policy, advocacy, and outreach to adults and families, as well as community science projects, mostly around water. We have an environmental education program that provides systemic environmental education in um, our local public schools, as well as field trips and programs for kids in all sorts of schools and other settings, and adult education programs that teach people about nature and take them on amazing field trips, uh, which have begun again in small socially distant doses if you are excited to come on a field trip uh, in our region. Um, and we are, are headquartered at Wood End Nature Sanctuary in Chevy Chase, which is 40 acres, which we are lovingly restoring to the future uh, and making it a space of nature for all, where all are welcome, uh, all wildlife, all people, and you, the grounds are still open, sunrise to sunset. They've been open throughout the pandemic, and you're welcome to visit us at our headquarters. Um, so with that, just a little bit more about how this evening will work, and then I will turn it over to our moderator. Um, oh. I already mentioned we're the oldest environmental organization in the DC region. Here's our mission and our vision. Um, and I'll just speak briefly to our vision because this series is very much in line with it. It is to create a larger and more diverse community of people who treasure the natural world and work to preserve it. Uh, tonight, if you're especially on Twitter, feel free to tweet with the hashtag Conservation Cafe and do add us at ANS Tweets and check us out on the rest of our social media. And now a brief introduction back to our panelists. Uh, and I'll just tell you why I invited them all. So I've had the pleasure, first I invited Shantae, who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, for a number of years since she was at the Choose Clean Water Coalition. And she's now with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, she's gonna introduce herself professionally, plus I think you read their bios ad nauseum when you were signing up for the program. So I'm just gonna tell you that Shantae has been a great friend of the Audubon Naturalist Society and of and the environmental community writ large in our region. And she has used her expertise and her voice to really elevate the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in a way that is so meaningful and so impactful uh, and has really touched us all. And if you know Shantae, you know that she does that both through her work and through her skill set, but also in her, in her person and in her way of being and in her, in her way of, of providing the gift of her time and her advice. So reached out to Shante first and she said, let me have a gift of time and advice for you, which is um, let's make it a panel and invite some others. And so the next two people I'm going to introduce you to, Ruby and Gabby, are serving on our Naturally Latinos Conference Planning Committee. And that's how I've gotten to know them this year. And we are so excited about Naturally Latinos and we're so excited to have them on our planning committee. Um, and Ruby is with the Nature Conservancy, where he's the manager of uh, diverse partnerships, I think is the exact right title, but I don't have it in front of me, alas. Um, and she asks great questions, tough questions, and she's so thoughtful in the replies and the responses. And I just couldn't think of someone better at that role than in the small amount I've gotten to know Ruby um, and how how thoughtful she's been in all these ways. And finally, Gabby has been with the Chesapeake Conservancy for some time, also on the planning committee. And she is a 
Zoom webinar panel expert, and she's going to do a fantastic job as our moderator. And I'm just so excited to have all three of you. So thank you, a big thank you to all of you. And I will now turn it over to Gabby. Thank you, Eliza. Um, and I just also wanted to pre-warn everyone that my cat Puck will be making some appearances in today's panel. Um, so just wanted to let you all know about that. Um, so yeah, I wanted to introduce myself uh, first and then have our panelists introduce themselves as well. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Rafi. I go by Gabby sometimes. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the manager of equity and community engagement at Chesapeake Conservancy, which is a nonprofit based out of Annapolis. Um, before I get into my background, I do want to do a land acknowledgement because if we were all together in person, we would be sharing the same land. We're scattered across the country now, but it's still really important to acknowledge the fact that we are all on stolen land and to acknowledge the people who came before us here. So I'm joining you from Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm on Piscataway territory, as are most of our panelists who are in the DMV area. And I'm gonna drop a link in the chat if this is something that you might not be familiar with. If you want to do some research into whose land you are residing on, there's a really great interactive map that can um, tell you all about that. Um, so my background is in community engagement, diversity, equity, inclusion and justice and environmental justice. I've been working across the country for the past 10 years, kind of toggling back and forth between my home in Baltimore. Um, I've worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Aquarium, but now my focus is on the Chesapeake Bay, which is my home. Um, and I lead our diversity, equity, inclusion and justice work within our organizations. I also am a partnership staff with the National Park Service Chesapeake Bay office. So I have a big reach with a lot of our partners and try to bring the work that we're all doing together um, collectively um, to more, more folks. So I'm really honored to be on this panel um, or to be moderating a panel with Ruby and Shantae because they are forces of nature within this movement. And I look up to them and admire them and have calls with them all the time when I have questions and need support. So I really appreciate both of you. Um, and I'll have uh, Shante go ahead and introduce yourself now. Thanks, Gabby. Um, that was a lovely, lovely introduction. So my name is Shante Coleman. Um, I'm half black, half white, cisgender, raised in San Diego. My pronouns are she, hers. As Gabby said, I'm calling in from Piscataway territory in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I'm currently the Vice President of Equity and Justice at the National Wildlife Federation, uh, where I focus on culture change and inclusion um, and supporting staff of color and other staff with marginalized identities. Previously, I was the director of Choose Clean Water Coalition. I see a lot of familiar names from my coalition days um, here in the participants, so nice to see everyone that I know. And I'm uh, really happy to be here tonight, even though it's maybe bumping up a little bit toward my bedtime or it's just getting dark earlier because it's fall. I'm not sure. I'm a little sleepy. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Thank you, Shante. I'm getting sleepy too, but this is invigorating. So um, Ruby, would you introduce yourself? Sure. And thank you for saying, Shante, that this is close to your bedtime, because sometimes I feel bad that I go to bed so early, so I don't feel bad, that bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi everyone, my name is Ruby Rivera, my pronouns are she, her, ella, and I'm originally from Puerto Rico, but now I reside in Washington, D.C. Um, I work for the Nature Conservancy and I'm part of their Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team, and I'm their um, conserva uh, Conservation Partnerships Manager. Um, a lot of my work has to do with equitable partnering, but also I do a lot of work around creating tools so that um, conservation practitioners can integrate that equity lens into their work. So sometimes I focus that on gender equity, sometimes we focus that on race equity, it depends. Um, before I worked for the Nature Conservancy, I worked for a smaller nonprofit based out of um, Maryland, and I did a lot of um, work um, regarding watershed management and restoration. The really great thing about working for that organization was that even though it was based out of Maryland, 
um, we had projects in Puerto Rico, so I would go every two months um, back home and really work with communities there implementing um, watershed restoration projects. So that's where I got a lot of my experience working with communities and really understanding the value of partnering. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Ruby. All right, so um, before we get into the questions, because I have some really awesome loaded questions for both of you, which I'm so excited um, for you to answer. I do just kind of want to frame the conversation and why we are here to talk about these topics. Um, obviously, there are two really big things happening in our country and the world right now. One is that we're all home because of COVID-19. We're facing this unprecedented times of a global pandemic. Um, and then as we're all sitting at home, we're also watching um, all of these injustices happening on our phone screens, on the television, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the many who have come before them and after them. And this big uprising in the civil rights movement, the largest one in history, um, has created this conversation that I believe many of us have been having behind closed doors for a long time um, in the environmental movement. But now a lot more has come to light and people are starting to really want to learn. They're taking the time to listen and truly unlearn a lot of the histories that we have, um, have, have learned in this country. And so this was a great opportunity for a topic um, around how us in the environmental movement can grapple with racism, diversity, and justice, because the injustices happening in our country are um, are not limited. Are, they're not limited to one area, and our history, specifically in the environmental movement, has a pretty strong history of racism. And Eliza, I know that you have a slide that you can pull up um, to kind of show some quotes about the founders and the fathers of the conservation movement um, who were explicitly racist and linked white supremacy to their goals of conserving and preserving nature. And this is a history that we have to acknowledge in order to move forward and in order to break systems of oppression and do anti-racism work within our field uh, and reckon with this past. And so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to get into the ways in which we are perpetuating this white supremacy culture in the conservation movement, especially as we think about stewardship. And we're going to understand what we can do individually and collectively in order to right the wrongs of the past and move together into um, a future in which we break these systems of oppression. And Ruby and Shante have extensive work in this within their organizations, so they'll be giving us a lot of great insight on how we can do this at our organizations and in our own personal lives. So um, another oh, pre-reading, so I, I hopefully everyone read the, the article on the environmental racist history um, from the New Yorker. Um, but as you can see from these quotes, the fathers of conservation were explicitly racist and perpetuated a lot of these new, uh, notions within the conservation movement. And Eliza, you can go to the next slide too. Um, there was an article that I wrote in the Bay Journal, so hopefully everyone had a chance to read. Um, and Shante was uh, wonderful enough to um, help me with that article because when we're talking about COVID-19, when we're talking about the historic and the current oppression of um, by POC communities, and um, I'll say now, when we say by POC, that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So that might be some of the terminology that we'll use. And if anyone has questions to the terminology that we use throughout, please put that in the question or in the chat box. Um, but I was reading this summer a short story, it was in a sci-fi book actually, um, where the author said it's no coincidence that aspiration means both hope and the act of breathing. When we speak, we use our breath and our lungs to give our thoughts a physical form. And the sounds we make are simultaneously our intentions and our life force. I speak, therefore I am. And the point of this is that in as we move forward into um, 
our work in the conservation movement, we really need to be thinking about voice and the breath of people of color um, as we move forward so that we can amplify their voices and, and allow people of color to lead in this movement. So with that, I will get into the next, the first question. Um, what is environmental racism uh, exactly? And how does it affect BIPOC communities? And um, I'll also let Eliza speak to this one because she wrote some lovely articles in the last newsletter that went out. Thank you, Gabby. I, should, I, should I go ahead? Yeah, okay. go ahead, Ruby, and then I'll let you jump in. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think this is a really good question to start the conversation with, just defining what environmental racism is. Um, and it's pretty much super straightforward, is the disproportionate impacts um, that communities of color are subjected to because of different um, hazardous um, or environmental hazards, right? So it happens because of different reasons. It could be policies that are put in place or regulations that are put in place um, or even government and corporate decisions that allow for, for example, undesirable land uses to be put in communities of color. And those will result in disproportionate impact to those communities and their health. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward, it's, it's that disproportionate impact on those communities of color. And there's a lot of um, examples that we can go back to, um, to really understand what environmental racism looks like. Um, I'm pretty sure you have all heard of Flint, Michigan. Um, there's also the Cancer Alley in Louisiana, which is a really interesting case of um, a corridor of around 60 miles um, where predominantly African-American um, communities live in that corridor. And um, there's over a hundred different industries that are polluting industries that um, also live in that same corridor. So um, that's just one example of how it's been intentional. You know, some decisions have been intentional in putting these industries there and knowing that those um, industries will affect these communities that are communities of color. Um, another case that is more um, uh, relevant to the context of, of where I grew up, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and um, there's a really interesting case that happened um, to the muni a municipality island that we have to the northeast of the island called Vieques. And this is another case of where a U.S. government um, decision really put um, um, exposure or exposed communities of color towards um, heavy metal exposure and even, you know, uranium. And it was because the U.S. government put a, um, a U.S. Navy testing um, uh, base in that community, which is a small island, 10,000 people were exposed to that. And it was so bad that the, the whole island was put in the EPA Superfund site for a cleanup site. And also it's one of the, um, um, municipalities with the highest uh, cancer rate in Puerto Rico and it's correlated to that exposure that the US government um, put us in. So, so I just wanted to share some of those examples because this is something not new, even though we're talking more about it, this is something that has been happening for, for many years. And also, I want to share that, you know, environmental racism, yes, it happens because of maybe really direct um, policies, that are put in place, but also it can happen because of some things that are maybe more indirect. And something that comes to mind is, for example, redlining and gentrification. Those are um, phenomena that really also um, create a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, and there's a really cool article, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Elisa share a little bit more on this because I think she has a lot more to say on this, but there's a really cool article in the New York Times that talks about the correlation between um, redlining communities or redlined communities in the 1930s and now how they have some of the highest heat disparities and also some of the um, uh, lower amounts of green spaces, which is connected to health and human well-being. So I just wanted to share that environmental racism can happen in very direct ways, but also in very indirect ways. Ruby, can I follow up on that? Um, ah. Those are fantastic examples. And 
Just to take a step back and provide a little bit of historical context about the term environmental racism. So that actually came from the environmental justice movement. So I don't know if you all have ever given a lot of thought as to why the environmental justice is a se separate thing than the environmental or the conservation movement, but I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And so the EJ movement is separate because traditional, as Ruby said, traditional conservation and environmental organizations were basically erasing BIPOC communities and low income communities. And so, you know, when you look at John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt's views of, of like wild nature and places that need to be saved for leisure, basically for rich white men, um, this was, and this was also used as rationale to forcibly remove uh, native people from national parks. And so the conservation movement wasn't, as you saw in the article, not created for or by BIPOC people or communities. So basically in the 1980s, there were so many environmental impacts, um, cancer clusters, asthma from emissions, um, impacts of climate change, lack of access to food, lack of access to um, public spaces. And the EJ movement really responded to that and the fact that the current environmental organizations were ignoring it. And they started grassroots organizing around environmental racism and coined that term specifically. And so I don't know if you all have heard of this report. In 1987, the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial, Racial Justice published like the first ever report of its kind that showed that the placement of toxic waste facilities was linked directly to communities of color and low-income communities. And it was the first report of its kind. They're specifically putting toxic waste facilities into these communities. And so you know, this sort of blew up into the, the big green letter. I don't know if you all heard of that. The environmental justice groups wrote a letter to the big green groups. National Wildlife Federation was one of them saying, you all are not paying attention to the communities that are most impacted. And they basically called the groups out for being racist and hiring as well and having completely white staff, completely white boards, completely white leadership. And so I just wanted to give a nod to the EJ groups for, because when they wrote that letter, the big green for the first time started taking this conversation a little bit seriously and that spiraled into the executive order and a lot of other things. Um, but the conversation that we're having on this Zoom call today, I feel it can be attributed to that energy that was created by that letter back in 1991. So I just wanted to name that. Thank you both for those histories and the current examples of how it's happening. Um, Eliza, would you like to chime in and talk about the local DMV area and show us a map? I'll, I'll be happy to, yeah, to localize the conversation a little. And again, I, I do want to mention that when we talk about um, redlining, which is really about uh, the ways in which racist decisions were used to shape land values, that is that kind of was an early domino that led to so many other, lead, led to and leads to so many other examples of environmental justice. Um, but the, there, it's, it by itself doesn't necessarily explain, doesn't only explain why there are more toxic waste hazards, for example, um, in low income and BIPOC communities. Um, you know, those, the placement of hazardous or more polluting um, industries or sites or facilities happened in communities that did not get redlined, happened before redlining, uh, you know, happened in places where redlining is no longer really relevant because of gentrification, where they just changed the, the, those things. So, um, you know, the redlining that happened in the early part of the 20th century, and it was really a phenomenon um, bef before, uh, well, in the, in the first half of the 20th century, is only part of the explanation for why there are so many place-based hazards where people live, especially low income and BIPOC people live. So I'll just, I will show you my map and explain it very briefly for the DC region, um, which actually didn't get redlined per se. Redlining is a, was a very specific tool that came about because of the, um, the, the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation that said where federal dollars could go. Uh, this was a, this was a different tool that happened in our area for insurance products. So it wasn't about mortgage loans, it was about insurance products. But if you couldn't get a federal insurance product, then you couldn't get a private loan anyway. So it had much the same effect. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is that the, uh, this is what they did in 1937, the federal government had a, a policy of creating these maps and grading all the areas according to how desirable they were in this case for insurance purposes. 
Someone said you can only see the bottom third of the map. Does it? I, hmm. I don't really know how to explain that. I am screen sharing the whole thing. Let me start the screen share again. Um, hopefully that is better. Okay. Uh, and for example, you've got areas down here, some of the lighter colored areas down here is type H. Type H is described as represents the Negro developments and the lowest grade of residential area. The only possible future is that the present scattered structures may be raised and new planned subdivisions instituted in their place. And indeed, the historic community of Berry Farms, um, which was one of the oldest free black communities in the area, was raised here and replaced with um, public housing instead. And then some of the other areas, type A, uh, oh, surprise, surprise, up here, um, is described as containing the high, appealing to the highest type of occupants. And if I was at my office at Shin Chevy Chase at Woodend, I think I would be very close to various grades A and E up here. Um, so you can just see that they used these really subjective, really racist characterizations that had real monetary value and resulted in a, entire generations of families not being able to get wealth from home ownership. And it started out bad, but it got really bad after World War II when we saw this enormous wealth leap in the white community that had access to GI Bill and subsidized loan products through it that completely skipped black communities in particular because they lived in these areas where those federal loan products would not be used. Uh, so it's, it's multi-generational at this point. Thank you, Eliza. And from uh, experience in working in environmental justice communities across the country, this is not limited to the DMV and DC area. I live in Baltimore where we have the black butterfly, um, which is still very apparent on a map today. And you can look that up. It's pretty appalling to see that map. And in Kansas City where Troost Avenue cuts right through the center of the city um, and the wealth and the white people are on one side and people of color and environmental justice communities are on the other side. So um, it's something that we need to grapple with now and really understand that history so that we can make change moving forward and start to really understand how to break these systems of oppression. So one thing that was mentioned um, was that the majority people working in the environmental movement and that the UCC report um, and now in all of the Green 2.0 reports is that um, most people working in, in the environmental field are white. So I'm curious to hear from you all, um, what do, how does the white majority contribute to environmental racism? Um, how are they grappling with it? And how, what can we do to dismantle these structures of racism? Sure, I can go ahead. <clears throat> I think um, there's different ways in how the white majority is contributing to environmental racism. I think um, one of the things that I that comes to mind is that by benefiting from that white dominant culture and really turning a blind eye to the impact that you know environmental hazards are having in neighboring communities that are communities of color, I think that's one way in how we are contributing by perpetuating you know these. Um, racist systems and oppressive systems up on top of these communities, right? And I think one um, thing that I've been um, learning more and more about is, you know, how NIMBYism, which I'm sure some of you have heard of before, um, and let me plug my computer before you guys. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, NIMBYism, which is not in my backyard, is a phenomenon that I'm sure some of you might have heard before. It's pretty much this opposition of residents. I had a feeling that was gonna happen. <laughs> I was like, please don't let Ruby's computer die. I don't wanna do I this. saw her face as soon as she went out. She's like, no. no. <laughs> well, I can take a, wasn't gonna be as good as what Ruby was gonna say. However, I can share from my perspective. Um, so I think if we wanna dismantle racism, we have to talk about racism. And I feel like that's what we're doing today on the Zoom call, which is great. Keep talking about it, keep doing the personal work, keep learning about how you show up in the world, understand how you're perpetuating racism, really important. 
I wanted to give an example of something that I, I was going to follow up with Ruby, but this is still a good example of um, something that I learned about recently. I don't know if it really falls into environmental racism, but I just want to, I'm going to be like at the VP debate where I'm not going to actually answer the question. I'm just going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. So a historical example is, so everyone knows that wildfires are happening in California right now. Um, natives were the original stewards of the land there in what is now known as California. Um, native peoples actually did, they did controlled burns, which were religious ceremonies that cleared out underbrush and encouraged new plant growth. And then when white settlers arrived with their concepts around being afraid of fire, uh, they suppressed these controlled burns, they forcibly displaced tribes, and their religious ceremonies went along with the tribes. And so now, we see wildfires raging across California and government officials are actually bringing back good fire as a part of the solving the problem. And they're working with the indigenous community to do this. But the problem is, is that it's actually harder to reintroduce good fire into the system when it's been gone for so long. So, you know, it's interesting because like the white majority, the settlers, like they were explicitly racist. They were forcibly removing Native Americans and we're still struggling with the ramifications of that today related to conservation. So it's really not serving us or, or the natural environment. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And I think it's positive that California is building relationships with the indigenous community. Um, I think it's a really good example of leaning on black indigenous people of color communities because we know that the people who are closest to the problem know how to solve them. And so, <laughs> We need to be working with the people who are most impacted in order um, to really know how to solve the problem. So Ruby, I was just talking as you came back. Just Thank you. And of course, words. yeah, of course my computer dies in the middle of a webinar, you know? <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that. But I was just talking about nimbism, which is that phenomenon that is not in my backyard. Um, and it's an opposition usually from residents um, against some type of undesirable um, land use. And I've been thinking about how this is perpetuating that the impacts to of those undesirable land use goes to community goes to communities of color because what happens is um, usually more affluent, um, predominantly white communities will have a better chance of fighting against these polluting industries or these undesirable land uses, and then the repercussions of that um, designated land use will go to a neighborhood that is predominantly a community of color, right? So. In a way, if we are saying we don't want this in my backyard, we should also say we sh we don't want this in our neighbor's backyard. This if if we don't want it for us, why would we want it for another community, right? So I think that's one way where um, we could be advocating for um, fair policies, fair regulation, fair um, designation of land use, and completely um, pushing back against polluting industries that are. If, if we don't want them, why we should uh, put them in another place where they would be affecting people as well. So that's one way. Another way, when we talked about earlier about redlining and gentrification, um, we could be very um, intentional and um, very conscious about where we move and how we're investing our money and in what communities, right? This way we are um, promoting that there's not a divestment in certain communities and also we could be pushing for more affordable housing so that everyone has um, equitable access to the same type of housing. Um, so those are ways in which the white majority can contribute to um, benefiting everyone and, and working for the benefit of everyone. Um, another thing that I want to um, also share is you know, us, um, we, most of us probably work in organizations that are predominantly white. And I think we have been working to really benefit a very specific um, part of the population, which is a predominantly white middle class population. But I think, you know, there's um, a new, more inclusive um, way of doing environmentalism that is really starting to take um, popularity, which is intersectional environmentalism. And I've been um, a fan of Leah Thomas, which is the, an African-American woman that really coined this term using um, the theory of intersectionality from Professor Lee Krimberly Crenshaw. And what I like about this particular way of thinking how to do environmentalism is that it's a more inclusive um, version of environmentalism. And it really puts in the forefront 
the both people and nature. I think in the past, we have seen that the conservation movement has really focused on preserving land and um, uh, conserving birds and things like that. But we have always missed this connection between people and nature. I think it's been almost like there's been a line that has been drawn between those two worlds. And in reality, what we should be doing is really trying to um, connect them, right? So this new way of thinking and of doing inter uh, environmentalism, intersectional environmentalism, really focuses on the injustices that are happening both to marginalized communities and also, you know, Earth. Um, and what I like particularly about this and how I feel we could be bringing this into our work, particularly in predominantly white organizations, is that it really um, thinks about the multiple identities that a person can have and how um, those multiple identities can really shape up how you experience um, the world and how you're treated in that world, right? So that means that for some people, discrimination could be multiple layers of it and not just one because of the multiple identities that you have. So I think, you know, us that have worked in, in, in conservation and within environmental organizations need to be more conscious about really understanding the complexities of communities and that certain communities bear more discrimination than others. And we need to bring that into our work in every single part of our work. So. Yes, can I, can I just briefly touch on that? Because I think that's really important. Um, one of the biggest critiques of uh, the white environmental movement by the environmental justice movement is that the white environmental movement gets excited and wants to work on EJ and then moves into a space and essentially steamrolls all of the groups who are already working in that space. And we are the larger groups, like we don't take that time to like, understand the work that's already happening. We don't take the time to understand that resources need to be shared, that if there were ever past harms between our organizations and those communities, that those need to be understood and redressed before we can do that work, which also takes time. And we need to recognize the leadership of those communities. We need to follow through on shared commitments and we've broken so much trust. So Ruby, I totally agree, like we have to, build trust and respect to communities like that comes first. And when we're, we, we work at warp speed in the environmental movement, like we're so in this like white supremacy culture of like urgency and perfectionism, we have to do it now that um, it just has a really negative impact when we try to work in communities. So I guess my biggest piece of advice would just be to slow down. And I know a lot of times our grants don't allow for trust building. Uh, which we need to work with the foundation side on that. There needs to be time built into grants for trust building. If there's any philanthropy people on the phone, please do that um, because that is a really important part of collaborating and working in communities. I, I wanna to respond to something very specific that Shantae just brought up, which is what, white supremacy culture. And I'm a white person and that means that I'm a white supremacist probably means that most of us are white supremacists because it's really baked into so many elements of our culture that, you know, one, one, one part of being white means you don't have to think about race. Mm -hmm. So you don't realize what are the characteristics that we carry with us uh, as part of our race. Unlike people of color who spend a lot of time thinking about race um, every day, um, whereas white people just are not, don't have to address that issue. Um, so the phrase Shantae brought up when I first heard it, made me very nervous. Like, I do not want, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> White supremacists are like those crazy people that just tried to kidnap the governor of Michigan. <laughs> you know, that's not me, of course. Um, which is similar, of course, when you hear, I can't be racist. Those are those other people are racist. Um, but we can, in fact, all be those things, both racist and white supremacist, and not realize it. And it doesn't really have to do with being bad or good. It has to do with being a fish who lives in water. You know, it just has to do with, this is, this is what we drink and breathe and, and live in. So there's a list of what are what's the characteristics of white supremacy culture that ref, that Shante, I think, was referencing. Um, and that certainly has this long list. Thanks, Gabby, for dropping it in. Um, and if, if, if you're a white person, if you're anybody, really, if you haven't seen this list before, after the talk, just click over that link and, and just sit with it for a little while. And think about how many of those behaviors you do in your work life in particular or in your personal life and just to recognize that they feel like this is work. This is the way the office is supposed to be. But 
they're the way that the majority culture has defined the office to be. That may not be how other people would prefer to be working or would naturally work or would more comfortably work or would more effectively work, really. I mean, that at Audubon Naturalist Society and our executive director, Lisa Alexander, is on, you know, her line is, we want to be here 122 years from now, which means that we want to serve the community of which we're a part successfully and effectively, which means that we need to be truly inclusive and truly equitable and, and truly diverse. Um, so that, that does include even examining challenging cultural elements, which is hard. So that's my note that I wanted to provide. Thank you for sharing that, Eliza. I know it's a lot to grapple with, but it's important to do that reflection as we're doing this learning and unlearning so that the cultures aren't perpetuated forward any longer. Um, and I mean, a big part of that is retention. If you have a majority white staff and you're trying to hire more people of color, if you want to retain people within your organization, you really need to be thinking about the culture as well. So I think that we'll get into that conversation next. So beyond reconciling past harm, why is tackling environmental racism, diversity, and justice critical to the future of the environmental movement? Um, so reconciling past harm is really important, but I won't, that is very important, um, but I won't touch on that. So the way that I've been talking about this at the National Wildlife Federation is we're basically at a choice point. Um, I spoke about harmful ideologies perpetuated by the white men who started this movement, which are still ingrained in our movement and our country today, white supremacy, racism, sexism, you see all of this. The face of our movement is white. The leadership of our movement is white. The majority of our boards are white. Um, we're seeing these ideologies, white supremacy, racism, show up in the world, in current events with violence against black bodies. Indigenous people are still in the midst of an era of forced federalism of their lands. They're facing issues like taxation, um, gaming. So all of this is happening and <laughs> We're seeing increased impacts of climate change, natural disasters, pollution, habitat destruction is causing detrimental health effects. Um, extractive industries are just blowing up and taking over land, water, um, land that has been set aside for preservation. And then we're seeing folks who are, you know, communities of color and poor communities who are the most impacted by all of this, especially climate change. It's like, we have a choice to make. Um, we can pivot away from harmful practices, policies, ideologies. We can move toward power sharing and a justice framework. We have a choice about ensuring that our future is better than our past. And that is the moment that we're in right now. Because if we don't get this right, we're gonna lose. We're gonna lose more humans. We're gonna lose our planet. So this is the why. And Angela Park, who's one of my mentors, she's an equity consultant, she's amazing. Um, she uses this analogy of a moving walkway. So if you are walking, like it's a moving walkway of oppression. So if you're walking along the walkway, like toward where the walkway is moving, like you're swimming in the sea, like Eliza said, we're swimming in the sea of, of white supremacy culture. If you're just standing on the moving walkway, you're still being carried, like being carried with the current. You have to turn around and actively move against the moving walkway so that, and moving against that means we're over with black and brown people being treated as disposable and being sacrificed. We're, we're done with sacrifice zones. So we really just need to get our stuff together because we're gonna become completely irrelevant or even worse, we're not gonna show up authentically when it really matters when people are suffering like we're seeing in the news every single day. So that is, that is my way, that is my truth and that's why I show up to do my job every day. Uh, that was extremely powerful. I was like, shivers all over. Thank you for sharing that truth, Shante. Um, Ruby, would you like to add anything to that? I think that was perfect. So I'm going to let it there, leave it there. Thank you. All right. Um, my next question is that um, with the current situation in our country and what we're seeing on the news and um, you know, this past summer, we've seen a lot of organizations 
um, in the environmental movement and beyond, releasing statements in solidarity and virtue signaling towards anti-racism. Um, what can people do individually and collectively in order to be actively anti-racist and move towards black liberation? And I'd really like to talk about um, performative allyship versus genuine allyship here. And how are you actively shifting the cultures of your own organizations? That's a really big question. Um, so I'm gonna focus in on what you said about anti-racism because that's a really important question and we need to figure out what our goal is. So anti-racism, equity, and justice, just to be clear, are three different things. So what do we want? Do we want anti-racism? Which basically is all of us acknowledging that racism is real, which a lot of us already knew, some, some folks didn't know, and doing the personal work and you know, integrating that into what we're doing and you know, like trying to get woke. Or do we want equity? Equity is like maintaining sort of the current structures that we're working in, whether it's in institutional structures, policies, practices, all that, but it's sort of like moving BIPOC up into leadership and giving folks opportunities, but maintaining the white, maintaining the white people at the top who have the power. Or do we want justice? So justice is actually tearing down all of the structures that exist that are perpetuating white supremacy culture and are rooted in inequity and building new structures that will get us to a place of justice. So in my mind, like anti-racism is great. And I'm glad that we have, that we're, you know, grabbing onto something in this moment of, you know, unraveling 400 years of oppression. And let's focus on the long game because justice is where we really want to go. And it's not going to be easy because history and culture and ideologies are so ingrained in us that we need to constantly check ourselves and think expansively and differently about how we approach this work. We have to constantly challenge our assumptions because what we've been doing is wrong, the way we've been thinking is wrong, we have to think different. We have to reimagine, we have to reimagine who we are and how we show up in the world. And we have to think about the impact that we wanna have. So Gabby, I didn't mean to like change your question, but I feel like that's important. And then what are we doing um, for black liberation? It's what you have to do. You have to center black people if you want black liberation. Like if you haven't taken steps at your organization to support, resource, uplift, spotlight your black staff, then you need to go do that. That's step number one. NWF is resourcing at very high levels, our black employee resource group. We are putting together a large pot of money for out of network healthcare for black staff, for professional development for black staff. We're providing additional coaching for our black staff um additional days off right now because people are tired black people are tired right now it's exhausting showing up at work every day and navigating white supremacy culture and and seeing what's happening on the news like that's just real so equity work is about centering the people who are most marginalized black people in today's world in america are the most marginalized and so if we want to get toward black liberation and justice tear down the structures and rebuild them center your work on black people and um yeah i think those are like the two main things and we're trying to do it like we're not doing a great job we're doing some things you are doing a great job from my perspective um and knowing and understanding the way that the conservation movement is and having worked with many organizations and seen them um nwf is really leading the way and you, you are a force of nature, like I said earlier. So thank you for all that you do and for bringing that advice and perspective to this conversation and to others because we're all we're all following in your footsteps. Ruby, do you have anything that you want to add to that question? What are you doing at your organization and um, shifting the culture of white from white supremacy culture? Yeah. There's um, a few things that we're doing. I always feel like we could be doing um, a lot more. And I recognize that um, there's so much to do. And also sometimes within white predominant organizations, the work is very slow and we need to do better at that. But I do know that um, the Nature Conservancy is uplifting our um, employee resource groups. 
um, and putting a lot of resources so that we can uplift their voices and they could be um, they're being integrated with the executive leadership so that we can make decisions for the whole organization that are really going to be benefiting everyone. Um, so that's something that we're doing. I think equity, um, as Shante, you were, you were talking, I was thinking about equity because a simple thing like providing days off for your African-American staff, you know, that's really bringing equity into your, into your work because what you're saying is you're recognizing that there's so much pressure that right now African-American communities are experiencing and because you're recognizing that you know that in order for them to be successful, they need a break, they need a breather, right? So, so I think, you know, little things like that here and there really propel, um, you know, the empowerment and uplifting of um, different communities within your organization. And I think what you highlighted, Ruby, is um, a good example of the difference between equity and fairness. So fairness would be giving everyone the same amount of days off. Equity is offering additional days off in a very legal way to black staff. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I hear that too much of we can't pay that person more, we can't promote that person, that black person, because the white person in the same position, whatever, whatever, you know, and people will compare it and I'm like, but have you, all, have you all seen that, that um, the track where folks are starting in different places on the track and it's like the equity? I wonder if you can pull that up. Anyway, it's not that important, but I just thought that was a good, uh, I'm glad you touched on that, Ruby. Thank you for um, making that distinction, Shante. I haven't seen the track, but I've seen the giving tree and some other um, images about the difference between equity and equality. So I'll, um, I'll do some Googling in between and try to pull up some images for folks. All right, um, we've got one last question and then we'll move into the Q&A session of this Conservation Cafe series. So what can we do within our conservation work to address environmental racism and other institutional, systemic, and interpersonal inequities? I could start. I think this is one of my favorite questions because this is where I can like um, give examples of concrete things that we can do in our work. Um, and we can also do them at individual levels. But, you know, the first thing that I want to say, and I, and I think Shante, you said this very beautifully, is conservation will not be possible without justice and equity for all people, right? So we need to start from that point, recognizing that, and then we can move forward in doing um, and addressing um, environmental racism and in, you know, different types of inequities in our organization. Um, within the Conservancy, there has been a lot of work that has been happening in order to acknowledge that, you know, we have been benefiting from a very white dominant or white supremacist culture um, and that we have been operating very comfortable um, within that unjust and racist system, right, a racist society. And that it's time for us to really focus on that um, undeniable connection between conservation, race, um, social, um, economic justice, and that we need to really commit to using our resources, recognizing that we're in a place of a lot of privilege, a lot of power, um, and by recognizing that if we commit to, put, uh, to putting our resources towards more equitable and effective conservation, then we're moving into the right direction. And um, a lot of work is happening um, in different bubbles within the organization. And I wanna share a little bit about the work that I do, particularly um, around transformative funding mechanisms, because I think this is one way that we could really create change. Um, so I'm sure some of you might know, um, especially those that work in philanthropy, that there's huge inequities in the philanthropic sector and how much money goes how much money is available for um, environmental work and how much of that goes to environmental justice organizations, community-based organizations, and how much of that money goes to larger organizations like TMC. So I've been working on really trying to understand, you know, the inequities of the philanthropic sector 
and in recognizing where we are in that chain of like big foundations that give a lot of money, where we are kind of in the middle, and then organizations that are really doing community work and need um, more access to that um, to that funding, right? So one thing that we're doing right now, um, and this is happening within the Cities Network, which is a, a, a sub um, group within the Nature Conservancy that focuses on urban conservation work, is leveraging our place and um, the access that we have to funding and really trying to channel that to EJ organizations and community-based organizations that right now are in the front lines of many different things, right? Like COVID impacts, um, uh, systematic racism, like all of these different things. This is us thinking, you know, in a more intersectional way. And this doesn't mean that this is the best way of, you know, putting the money into the, the community-based organizations and environmental justice organization, but this is one way right now that we could be thinking about how we're transforming the way that we're funding and channeling those, um, that money, right? Eventually, a conversation needs to happen where it's like, why don't these big foundations give directly to these community-based organizations? But there's a lot of things that, you know, um, go into that. So right now what we're doing is, you know, creating um, this funding mechanism that allows for that funding to go from this bigger foundation into smaller community-based organizations, recognizing that they're the, they are the ones that know what they need and we can support them so that they can do the work that they need to do. Um, and recognizing that we, we, we don't work in communities, right? We're a larger organization that sometimes don't understand the complexities and the nuances of a lo local work. Um, so that's one way where, you know, you and your organization, if you have some sort of power over um, accessing resources and funding, that's one way that you can start thinking about sharing more equitably and really trying to leverage your position of privilege and power to put it in communities that, you know, are being disproportionately impacted by a lot of different things. And I can share about more, but I want Shantae to also add. That was great. Money and resources are so important um, to shift power. So I would just, I would say, I'm gonna to touch on the institutional systemic interpersonal component. Um, you all should be able to do an equity analysis. And equity analysis is understanding how inequities are playing out at four different levels. There's the ideological level, so that's racism, sexism, transphobia, all of that stuff. Then there's the institutional level. Those are the policies and practices that uphold the ideologies and keep them nice and placed at the top. Then there's the interpersonal level. So that's how it plays out between us as individuals. So that's if you hear a uh, racial microaggression, that's, in, that's inequity playing out on the interpersonal level. Then there's the internalized or individual level. It's how I then start to internalize uh, opinions or feelings about myself based on ideologies and based on what's happening on the other levels. And so I'm pushing the other executive team members at the National Wildlife Federation to be able to apply an equity analysis to NWF, we've gone through that exercise many times, but also to their, their work and their portfolio. So like, where does oppression show up in philanthropy? Where does oppression show up in finance? Where, you know, so like just asking those questions. So think about your work, think about what you do, your organization, and think about how oppression shows and inequity show up where you are. And because the only way we're gonna be able to start to counter these things is if we can name them and, re and recognize them. And then I would just say, like I touched on this already, but like uplift the black people at your organization and in your personal life, like if you're white, like do some work uplifting black people, like that goes a long way. And then keep doing the personal work. We send out resources. There's a lot of stuff in the chat box. Keep reading, keep learning, keep growing. And you're here today um, on this optional webinar learning more about racism. So uh, just keep it up. Um, really appreciate you listening. Thank you both for answering all of those questions so beautifully. Um, I think we've got about 25, 20, 20 minutes for Q&A from the audience. Um, I've got some questions lined up that have been upticked by other folks. Uh, and the first one I'm going to start with is Emily's question. Um, she went into her personal and professional background, um, being the only POC staff at her organization, growing up in an EJ community, and now has a, a pretty big question. 
um, how does she do um, EJ work and, and diversity work in a way to ensure that she's creating a relationship between folks from the EJ community and the mainstream organization that she works for, um, and that it's done towards justice and not just towards diversity, has an impact and has an impact for them and is helpful, not harmful, and also that her personal friendships and relationships remain intact. That's a big question. And I would just add to the question and ask also, like, how do you make sure that you're not tokenized in that process or boxed into only working on a certain type of work? Because I found that it's really easy for us BIPOC people to be assumed that we're going to be the EJ person or we're going to be the community partnerships person or we're going to do the DEIJ work and we're going to lead the committee and all of the stuff. Um, and so I actually try really hard to make sure that I'm still taking on some clean water policy projects. I'm, I'm an attorney. I have a background in clean water policy. That's my jam. So I want to make sure I'm still doing that work so that I don't get, don't get boxed in. Um, I think that I've seen a lot of my colleagues be pulled in at last minute, Black colleagues be pulled in at last minute to ma start managing partnerships with diverse groups. And so I would just say, if you can be involved early and often in the relationship and drive the pace of that relationship and not fall victim to the urgency of the culture, because your organization is probably going to want you to move really, really quickly. And it seems like you're going to want to spend time in that like trust building space. And then like, you know, if that doesn't, if that doesn't work out and doesn't feel good, maybe there are other organizations where you can work that would really value your skill set and working in EJ communities and building those authentic relationships. So without knowing much about you um, and just hearing your beautiful question, those are the things that I would share. Yeah, I, I think I would add also, you know, really trying to understand the intention behind why they want to do that partnership. I think that's really critical. Um, and also, I would say, and, and this is similar to what Chante said, but, you know, I think um, white supremacy culture really um, likes to work really fast and doesn't understand the value of slowing down and really doing a deep dive in, you know, the partnership and understanding what is, what are the needs of this community organization or this partner that you're wanting to work with and collaborate with. So I think something that you could do is like, you know, share the importance of really slowing down and creating a bond and really understanding what are the needs from both parties um, so that when you're doing that work together, you're truly benefiting each other and not it, it so that it's not a one sided relationship with which happens a lot. Um, sometimes organizations will partner up and then they just want to maybe check a box that they work with a certain community or they just wanted um, this community to do the outreach for them. And then there's no true um, support or value for, for that, that other partner that is more in the EJ or grassroots um, community. So just like, you know, slowing down and, you know, pushing for that slowdown, I think it's truly important. So I agree with Shante on that. Thank you. The similar question, or it kind of feeds into what you were both talking about, um, is are there any examples in the region where conservation organizations are working well with community groups working on EJ issues effectively that you would like to highlight? I, I can share a little bit. Um, so the Nature Conservancy, we have you know, local chapters in every single state and within the organization, we also have the work that happens within the CDs network. And a lot of the CDs um, work is rooted in really working with partners and community partners. So there's a lot of um, different uh, collaborations that are happening um, with more EJ, more grassroots organizations. And um, a lot of the work that we're doing is pretty much creating funding mechanisms so that we're truly, you know, sharing resources and putting the resources in the communities that are already doing the work. Um, so there, there are some good stories and also there's a lot of learning that happens within this work, right? It's, it's not all perfect, 
but I think the, the city's network is doing a great job at um, working closely with um, more grassroots organizations and really sharing power, which I think is something that um, larger organizations really need to um, learn and um, unlearn certain things about like sharing power and not coming in and wanting to take lead um, because there is a larger, more resourceful um, organization. Um, Mustafa Santiago Ali just did a series of environmental justice roundtables um, with a team at NWF. And these highlighted a lot of really amazing frontline community leaders as well as members of Congress. Everyone who sat on the panels were BIPOC. We had one that was a youth, youth roundtable and then we took all of that and did a national roundtable. So it's on our website, um, take a look, but a lot of really good information came from that. A lot of focus on water, infrastructure, all sorts of things. And so I also feel like we should think more expansively about our definition of environmental justice because we can probably all think of ways that we're working on environmental justice. We just haven't maybe traditionally called it that way or called it environmental justice. All right, next question. Um, and you kind of touched on this a bit, but we've talked about, um, and this is Jerry's question, um, we've been discussing diversity and culture in mainstream white organizations, but what about providing resources directly already to the POC majority and run organizations that are on the ground? Should we be doing that instead because they are often starved of funds um, and that they, yeah, or is it both? Oh, I want to go. Yeah, I'd like to address. So, um, my 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 team, my staff at the conservation program at Audubon Naturalist Society, we have been working for a number of years to build really authentic relationships with communities of color around our region. And our conferences, taking nature black and naturally Latinos, have been the seeds of many of those relationships. Not all. We've also used existing relationships to invite people to the conferences. Um, and one of the things we've learned is that we have, we, a majority white organization that still needs to fund and pay our staff, have become eligible for more grants than we were before if we go in in partnership with a frontline group. And we can provide skill sets and capacities that they may not have, like we're experts in environmental education. We know all about connecting people to their watersheds, but we don't know their community. They know their community. And there are a lot of grants that are geographic restricted that you can only apply if you're located in a specific place. For example, Washington DC, where we're not located. So we have a partnership right now with the Green Scheme where they're the primary grantee and we're splitting the money about 50-50. And, um, and they're kind of the lead, you know, they're officially the lead organization, um, but we, we actually brought them in. We knew we wanted to do the project and we reached out and said, do you wanna do this project with us? It would only work. It would only work if you did it. We can't do it if you don't say yes. You know, we're not going to come in to this community and try to run this project in Ward 8 if we don't have a partner who authentically knows, you know, that they would like us there and that they know what to do and that it'll be successful together. Um, so I've been thrilled. This is our this is our second or third partnership in this way, and um, it's not the same as just give the money directly to the green scheme. They should also be eligible for grants that we're not eligible for. Um, but it's a grant that they would not. Um, have applied for had we not approached them. Um, so they got new funds for it. And then, you know, we were also able to to do what we do best. So I just want to throw that out as a really, really specific hyper local example. Yeah, and I want to add to that. I think you're bringing up a point that is very important. So one thing that we have um, learned in this process of creating transformative funding mechanisms is that foundations, bigger foundations, um, find that smaller organizations are um, risk, riskier, right? It's riskier for them to sh share or give out grants to these smaller organizations for different reasons, biases, discrimination. We can go into all of them, right? Um, so one thing that um, it's really good for maybe larger organizations to do is bear some of that um, weight of, for example, the um, finance work that goes into getting these grants, right? So smaller organizations maybe don't have the capacity because they're limited in staff, they already are, you know, spreading too thin. So sometimes it's good if you're in a larger organization that has a little bit more capacity to bear some of that weight 
um, in order for that organization to still be able to access the money, but then the larger organization that has more capacity and recognizes that has more capacity takes some of that from, from them, um, allowing them to still access the funding. So one of the funding mechanisms that we're working on right now is one, doing that. So for example, we have to go through a due diligence process, which is like a legal process where there's a bunch of um, documentation that usually smaller organizations that we're granting out to have to, to do. And that is sometimes too much work because, you know, these smaller organizations, they don't want to be doing paperwork. They want to be in, in the communities doing the work that they need to do, right? So what we're doing is transferring that responsibility to us preparing a team that will take charge of that finance piece. And we're just asking for, I think, two pieces of documentation, a W-9 and something else, and that's pretty much it. So you're almost like shifting um, that work towards the organization that has a little bit more capacity to be able to, to carry that weight. Um, also, we're being more intentional in the eligibility criteria and really trying to think, you know, eligibility criteria that why sometimes we add a lot of um, requirements to our funding mechanisms that don't really need to be there. And what they do is uh, serve as a barrier um, and limit the access to the funding to smaller organizations or community-based organizations, right? So thinking about all of those things that can make funding more accessible to other organizations, I think it's key in order to truly make transformative um, funding go into these communities. Thank you for sharing all of those nuances. I didn't know a lot of that, so thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, you want to- Can I answer a question in here that really interests me? Yes. So, anonymous attendee uh, asked for tips on being BIPOC and avoiding tokenism for DEIJ. So yeah, it's not easy um, because we do have the experience to lend to this work. Um, we're sort of naturally experts because of the lives that we've lived. Um, I really think it's important to be really clear about your boundaries and be really clear about what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. So I have like a super quick story that I'll share. Um, there was a executive leadership team retreat at my organization several years ago uh, when I was not in, it was a senior leadership, when I was not in senior leadership. And they had already sent out the invitations and it turned out that everyone who was invited, like all 50 people are white. And I was like co-leading the equity work at the time and someone responded to the email and said, well, we should at least have Sean McKay there. Like, that's pretty tokenizing in itself. The invitations had already gone out. I wasn't even a part of the agenda. And so my VP came to me and said, we want you to come to this senior leadership meeting. Um, and I was like, well, if I come, I'd like a purpose in the meeting and I wanna be set up for success. Because I had never been around this group before, so it was really important to me to show up the way I was supposed to show up. And I wanted to be a part of the meeting and not just be there to sit there. And it was like the Friday before and I hadn't heard anything. No one had communicated to me and we we're leaving on Monday. And so I, and it turned out that the whole equity portion had been planned without any of my knowledge. So like they did the whole agenda. They had conversations that we planned it all and hadn't even communicated with me about it. And so I had to go to my VP, which was very scary in that moment because I did not have positional power in my organization and say to her that I had to decline her invitation to the retreat and tell her because I was not going to be tokenized by going to that meeting. And she communicated that to my CEO. He like wrote me this really long email. So it was the whole thing. And that led to our, us reconstructing our senior management team in a way that's much more diverse and representative of the depth and breadth of our organization. But I guess so my one piece of advice would be just like speak up. Like don't, like when you see anything in your organization, like don't let things slide. If you hear a microaggression, if you notice something's, you know, inequitable, not sitting right, like call that out and say it to someone who can help you figure it out and make that change. Um, but don't just allow them to tokenize you because it will happen. Um, it's happened to me many times. I'm sure it's happened to other folks on, on this webinar. So that's a really good question. Um, and what I'll add to that is talk to your mentors. I've called Shante so many times to say, like, what do I do in this situation? And um, find a network of people who can support you in this work, especially if you are the only by POC person at your organization. Um, having that support network is crucial because 
being the only person in your organization as a person of color or doing DEIJ work is an extremely difficult burden to shoulder. Uh, so it's a lot on one individual. There's a lot of emotional labor uh, attached to it. So make sure that you have that support network. And if you don't, please reach out to the, uh, those of us on, on this call because we're happy to tap you into those networks. Um, Ruby, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say um, make sure also um, as much as possible that, you know, if they're bringing you into a project or into a conversation and they want you to share your experience or whatever it is and you feel comfortable doing that, that they also um, pay for your time and your expertise and the skills that you're bringing up. Sometimes a lot of um, BIPOC um, people do this work for free. And not only we're doing the work for free, but the emotional toll, no, no one um, uh, takes that into consideration. Like sometimes reliving some of the experiences that we have, that we go through, it, it's really painful. And I think we need to, you know, say this is valuable that I'm, I'm sh if this is valuable that I'm sharing this with you, you should also compensate for my time and for me opening up like this. Um, so just keeping that in mind, and I think, yeah, speaking up when something when something feels uncomfortable, probably it's because it's not right. And you know, having a network where where you can share, you know, what's going on, and just getting you know that soundboard that will let you know, yeah, this is wrong. Um, it's also super helpful so that you know when they're tokenizing you or not. Yes, don't do work for free anymore. If you are a BIPOC, do not do equity work for free. Period be compensated. If it's outside of your work plan, you should be compensated for that work that you're doing. No more free labor. Um, and building off Ruby's point, folks should be able to articulate the why. If they're coming to pick you for something, they should be able to tell you exactly why they're picking you for that thing. And it's not because they need a person of color there. And if they don't have a good reason, then that's probably the underlying reason. So just approaching it out of a place from a place of curiosity and asking questions like, oh, that's interesting, like, what made you think of me? And just getting to the bottom of that, I think can help tease out whether it's tokenization. And also I'll add, um, asking if they're bringing you into a project or something, um, asking for you to be part of the decision-making process. So having meaningful participation in the decision-making process, I think it's a good way also of like leveraging, you know, if, if they want my expertise, they want me here, not just because I'm a person of color, but because I can make decisions that are gonna be um, for the benefit of everyone in the, in the work and the outcomes of the work, so. Ask for all the things whatever you now is the time if you are BIPOC ask for whatever you need right now because everyone's looking for ways to help and be, let's be honest like we've suffered a lot so ask for whatever you need right now if you're not sure what to ask for then email me and I'll help you yes definitely email Shante <laughs> she will help you <laughs> Um, so uh, another question that came in um, along this topic, and this will probably be our last question, is that what's the best way to navigate centering um, by POC people without putting the extra burden to educate the predominantly white staff? That is so important. <laughs> I feel like the opt-in, opt-out is key. Um, I went to a yoga class. It was my first yoga class during the pandemic. It was outside on a floating dock. It was right after George Floyd was murdered. I was going out on a Sunday for the first time since quarantine. And I laid on my yoga mat on this floating dock and I'm like zenning out and totally chill. And my white yoga instructor starts the class with a, con with a story about the youngest person who's ever been killed of lethal injection in our country and told the story and framed it in a way of like another white yoga instructor learning about that and how she told her kids about it. And it was just super triggering. I'm like, I'm stuck on this dock and it's awkward. And I like, am I gonna get up and put my shoes on to became this whole thing and I'm crying and like, whatever. So I just feel like if you're going to center on white people and white learning, give people of color a chance to opt out and just say, I'm good, I actually don't wanna talk about this today. Like don't start your staff meeting with a check-in like and blindside unless you talk to the folks of color in advance like 
just just be really mindful about that. There's a lot of opening emails and finding a lot of surprises and social media is not safe right now. So we're sort of getting it from everywhere. So I would just that. Yeah, that's what I would advise. Ruby, do you have anything to add? No, but I do see a question coming in. Do, do we have time to answer one more or no? We do not have time Aww. to answer any more questions. That, your moderator chose the last question. Okay. Um, but what I would do is we have lots more questions than we could answer. And we are going to be, um, for everyone, thank you, capturing the entire chat in the Q&A. We'll share it with the panelists. And let me just briefly say what will happen starting tomorrow. Um, I hope tomorrow, although frankly, my kids are home from daycare, so this might happen on Monday, uh, get the recording done. And everyone who's registered, whether you're here right now or not, will get the link to the recording. And then we can also ask the panelists to digest anything else they'd like to respond to. And I can put that out in an email to everyone um, later next week. Uh, so we, we're capturing everything you've put in and we thank you so much. But I'll, I'll leave it to Gabby to finish wrapping up. Thanks, Ruby. I really like to end on time. <laughs> um, well, first, I just want to say thank you to Shantae and Ruby again for being leaders in this field and being my mentors and support system and for sharing your truths with this the Audubon naturalist community. Um, we have a lot to learn um, in the environmental field, and I hope that everyone is really listening tonight and go back and listen to the recording. Uh, rewind, repeat over and over again. There are some really great gems that Shantae and Ruby talked about here. Um, and continue learning and unlearning so that together we can really shift the, this movement and shift the trajectory of our country and, and this, this planet. So um, thank you both. And then also I want to thank Eliza for putting this together and for Audubon Natural Society for hosting such important conversations that really need to be had. So. Well, well, thank you. And thank you also, Gabby. Uh, you did a great job as a moderator. And, and thanks to Excellent all of you, job. really, for, for joining us. Um, these are, it's tough. Thank you. And, um, you know, Audubon Naturalist Society, we're continuing these conversations. Um, obviously, all our guests are continuing the conversations within their own organizations um, and places. But if you're an ANS member, um, you know, we welcome you. And so one thing I'm going to do is share a couple things with you all as the host. Let's see. So first of all, here's our thank you slide. Um, and they our, our, our guests have made it made these contact resources available. So they're here if you want to quickly scribble them down, but I will also um, uh, put them in a follow up email. So you know how to reach them and, and you may. Um, and thanks so much again to our panelists and moderator for your time.